In a previous video, we saw the probabilistic method, where the goal is to show that something happens with non-zero probability. In this video, we'll see another technique that we can use in the probabilistic method, and also elsewhere, called the second moment method. To motivate the second moment method, let's start with a question. Suppose that x is a real-valued random variable, and suppose that the expectation of x is really, really big. It might be intuitive that x is probably large since its expectation is, but is this true? That is, is it the case that x is probably large, or in particular, is it the case that the probability that x is equal to zero is small? Pause the video right now and think about it. Okay, so you've probably figured out that the answer is no, this is not necessarily true. For example, if x is a random variable which is equal to some very, very large number, like 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10, with some very small probability, but not too small, let's say probability uh, 0 0.01 and 0 otherwise, then the expectation of x is really, really big, but the probability that x is non-zero is 0 0.01, which is small. However, in this case, this random variable x also has a really large variance. It turns out that if the variance is bounded, then a counterexample like this can't happen. More precisely, we have the following theorem, which is also known as the second moment method. Suppose that x is a real value random variable. Then, the probability that x is equal to 0 is bounded above by the variance of x divided by the expectation of x squared. In particular, if the variance of x is small compared to the expected value of x squared, then this probability is also small. The proof of this theorem is not hard, it's basically just Chebyshev's inequality. So here it is, the probability that x is equal to 0, this is at most the probability that x minus its expectation, absolute value, is greater than the expected value of x. And by Chebyshev's inequality, this is at most the variance of x divided by the expected value of x squared. So this proves the second moment method. Even though the proof seems pretty simple, the second moment method can actually be very powerful. For example, there are some pointers in the lecture notes to a recent line of work that uses the second moment method to understand the probability that a random KSAT instance is satisfiable. So you should check those out if you're interested. On a personal note, as I was preparing these slides, I've realized that I have personally worked on three papers in the past year, uh, it's currently September 2020, where the second moment method has played a critical role. So it really shows up all over the place. In this video, we'll see one simple example of the second moment method in action. The question for this example is, is there a four clique in GNP? Before we answer this question, let me define the terms that appear in it. So we saw the definition of a four clique earlier. It's just the complete graph on four vertices. So here, this is a four clique. And we use the notation K4 to denote a four clique. GNP refers to a random graph more precisely, this is a random graph on n vertices, so that each edge exists with probability p independently. For example, a draw from the distribution g6, 1 half might look like this. I have six vertices, and then for each possible edge, I'm just going to flip a fair coin, and if the coin comes up heads, I'll draw an edge. So for example, maybe for this edge, the coin comes up heads. For this edge, it comes up tails, no edge there. For this edge, it comes up heads, and so on. And maybe we get something that looks like this. In this case, this graph does have a four clique right here. So what this question is really asking is, is it likely that there is a four clique in GNP? Here's the answer, which we'll prove using the second moment method. Theorem, there exist constants C1 and C2, so that for sufficiently large n, if p is smaller than C1 times n to the negative 2 thirds, then it's unlikely that GNP contains a four clique 
that is the probability that GNP contains a four clique, is less than 0 0.1. On the other hand, if P is greater than C2 times n to the minus two thirds, then the probability that GNP contains a four clique is large, greater than 0 0.9. And as we'll see from the proof, you can adjust these constants 0 0.1 and 0 0.9 by fiddling with the constants C1 and C2. To understand this theorem, let's consider drawing this graph. So here on the y-axis, I have the probability that GNP contains a four clique. And on the x-axis, I have P, which ranges between zero and one. The x-axis is not to any particular scale in this graph. This is just kind of a cartoon. What this theorem says is that there's some threshold right here around n to the minus two thirds. And as soon as P is a little bit larger than the threshold, it becomes very, very likely that GNP contains a K4. On the other hand, if P is a little bit less than the threshold, then it becomes very unlikely. Let's prove this theorem. We'll start with the first statement, which is easier. So we want to show that if P is small, smaller than C1 times N to the minus two thirds for some C1 that we get to choose, then the probability that GNP contains a four clique is small, less than 0 0.1. So to prove this, let x be the number of four cliques in GNP. So then the expected value of x by linearity of expectation is the sum over all sets s, subset of one through n, of size four, of the probability that all six edges between the vertices in s are present. Since all the edges are independent, this probability is just p to the sixth. And the number of things in this sum is just n choose 4. So this is altogether equal to n choose 4 times p to the 6. Thus, by Markov's inequality, the probability that x is greater than or equal to 1, that is, that the number of four cliques in GNP is at least 1, is at most the expected value of x, which by the above and our choice of p is at most n choose 4 times c1n to the minus two-thirds all raised to the sixth, which is at most n to the fourth, bounding the binomial coefficient, times c1 to the sixth times n to the minus four. The powers of n conveniently cancel, and this is just c1 to the sixth. In particular, this is at most 0 0.1 if we choose c1 to be small enough. So that proves this first statement. Let's move on to the second statement, for which we'll need the second moment method. We want to show that if P is large, larger than C2 times n to the minus two thirds for some constant C2 that we'll get to choose, then the probability that GNP contains a four clique is large, greater than or equal to 0 0.9. To prove this, let's define a random variable X sub S, where S is a subset of size four, to be equal to one, if S forms a K clique, that is, if all of the six edges between the four vertices in S are present, and zero otherwise. Thus, capital X, the number of K cliques, is just the sum over S of the X sub S, where the sum ranges over all such S. As a thought experiment, let's pretend that the X sub S are independent random variables. They aren't, actually. Uh, and if this isn't clear, pause the video for now and convince yourself that they are not. Okay, but let's pretend that they are. If they were independent, then the variance of x is equal to the sum over s of the variance of x sub s using this shady assumption of independence. And this is equal to the sum over s of p to the sixth times one minus p to the sixth using the fact that S sub X is a Bernoulli random variable that is one with probability P to the six. And this is at most N choose four times P to the six, using the fact that there are N choose four things in this sum. Thus, the probability that there is no four clique in GNP, but by definition, this is equal to the probability that X is equal to zero, and using the second moment method, this is at most the variance of x divided by the expected value of x squared.
Now the variance of x we just computed is at most n choose 4 times p to the 6th. Well, the expected value of x we computed earlier, this is n choose 4 times p to the 6th also, and then we're going to square it. So this simplifies to 1 divided by n choose 4 times p to the 6th, which is at most n to the 4th divided by n choose 4 c squared to the 6th, using the assumption that p is greater than or equal to c2 times n to the minus 2 thirds. And then this is at most 4 to the 4th divided by c2 to the 6th, using the approximation on the binomial coefficient that n choose 4 is at most n divided by 4 to the 4. Once again, if we choose c2 to be sufficiently large, then this probability is small, less than 0 0.1, and that will prove this second claim. Okay, so that's great. We proved the second claim, but we were cheating. These x sub s are not independent. So how can we fix this? We're not actually going to do the full proof here. Instead, we'll leave it to you. But we'll see how to get started. To get started, let's first think about what dependencies are there. Well, if s and s prime, two sets of size 4, have intersection size at most 1, then I claim that x sub s and x sub s prime are independent. Indeed, the only way that these two things are going to be dependent is if the two relevant four cliques share an edge. And if s and s prime have intersection size 0 or 1, they don't share an edge. Then we can start computing the variance of this random variable x, just like we did before. So the variance of x, by definition, this is equal to the expected value of the sum over s of xs all squared minus the expected value of x squared. Expanding out this square, this is equal to the expected value of the sum over s and s prime of x sub s times x sub s prime minus expectation of x squared. And now we can break up this sum into a bunch of different parts. The relevant parts are the one where s and s prime are equal, the ones where s and s prime are not equal and their intersection has size at most 1, and the ones where s and s prime are not equal and their intersection size is 2 or larger. So we can write this as the sum over s of the expected value of xs squared, that's the term where s and s prime are equal, plus the sum over s not equal to s prime, and the intersection of s and s prime is at most 1, plus the sum over all of the other pairs, s not equal to s prime, so that s intersect s prime has size greater than or equal to 2, minus the expectation of x squared. The thing to notice here is that this term is the only one that differs from the computation on the previous slide. That is, if we were to write out the variance like this in the special case that everything in sight were independent, this term would be exactly the same, this term would be exactly the same, and this term would be exactly the same. This one's the only difference. Fortunately, this term is pretty small compared to everything else. More precisely, there's something like n to the 8 terms here. This essentially comes from picking four vertices for s and another four vertices for s prime. And there's big theta of n to the 8 ways to do that so that the intersection is less than or equal to 1. On the other hand, the number of things in this term is big O of n to the 6th. Intuitively, this is because there can only be six vertices involved if s and s prime are going to share an edge. Therefore, this term ends up being a lot smaller than this term and doesn't really affect the computation too much. So if you were to do it out, you would find that this is more or less equal to what it would be if everything were independent. And as we saw in the previous slide, if everything were independent, then this variance is much smaller than the expectation of x squared if c2 is sufficiently large.
And that's all we needed to apply the second moment method. So obviously I've skipped a lot of details here. It's a really good exercise to go through and work out these details. Doing this will also demonstrate the flexibility of the second moment method. Even though it might be tricky to compute the variance exactly, for example, in situations like this where there are weird dependencies, bounding the variance often turns out to be not so bad. To recap, the second moment method seems pretty simple, but it's also really useful. As a quick example application, we saw, or at least sketched, that whether or not the random graph GNP contains a four clique depends pretty sharply on P. That is, there's this threshold around n to the minus two thirds, where if P is smaller than that, it's really unlikely that GNP contains a four clique, while if P is larger than that, it's really likely that GNP contains a four clique. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.